This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. GROA. Okay, we're, we're back, we're live, and we have an amazing first time only show. We're having a show uh, uh, with Jeff Grad, world traveler, eating lunch. I mean, you know, I mean, we, we could have been watching people getting a haircut, but instead we're having Jeff Grad eating lunch. Yeah, well, and it's okay, Jeff, you can eat during the show. Welcome. Thank you very much. If it had been me just having a haircut, it would be a very short show. Yeah, same with me. Yeah. We do have something in common. Yeah, yeah amazing. So anyway, uh, you were first you said you were going to discuss the new uh, DROA form, which you have on the table. Um, but then we thought that's probably not expansive enough for our discussion. So here on uh, you know Global Connections, we should talk about global, more global things. And it so appears uh, that you have just come back from Alaska because everybody is going to Alaska. And we need to compare notes with you. We've had several shows about Alaska. Uh, you know, Hawaii should celebrate Alaska, you know, 49, 50, all that. So can you tell us a little bit about your trip to Alaska, Jeff? Well, my trip uh, was on a ship just like the one that, uh, that you were on with your lovely wife. And, uh, and we, did it with, uh, we did it with three generations. So we had uh, my wife and I were the uh, oldest generation and our son and daughter-in-law and then their two kids. And I thought, you know, that would be... Uh, that would be an unusual way to go on some of these trips, but it turns out that that time of the year in August and in July, you know, the kids are on vacation and uh, and it's really a great family-oriented uh, vacation. And usually, I if I go on any of these cruises, that that people tend to be older and uh, less fit and less energetic. But this one was a was really good, so I'd say it's a it's really something that a uh, it's a great family trip, and especially for three generations. And so, yeah, to really encourage it. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, the, I, you know, our trip was on the Norwegian Sun, which uh, started in Seward, which is to the right. southwest part of Alaska, and then worked its way all the way to the northeast, the rather southeast part of Alaska in, in Vancouver. It was seven days. Um, we did not take a round trip. Did you take a round trip? No, actually, we took uh, the same trip as you did in reverse. So we actually started in Vancouver, and then we ended up in Seward. And, and as I mentioned earlier, we once we get off the ship, then my wife and I took uh, about a two or three hundred mile trip north, and we went up uh, to Denali, which is uh, the great mountain and a great national park, and maybe the biggest national park in the in the United States, and uh, uh, that was also a very interesting experience. Yeah, um, Seward, 1867, Seward's Folly, 17 uh, million acres, two cents an acre. Really? It was a great bargain. They don't do that here in Hawaii. Yeah, well, at that time they probably could have done a pretty good deal, but mm. you're right, now, now that's, uh, yeah. that's a very good price, and it's not quite such the folly, what with all the oil they discovered, and they, <laughs> Had a gold rush or two along the way, and uh, there's a lot of a lot of good stuff going on in, in Alaska. Yeah, what struck me uh, it's it's so different and interesting. I mean, here we have an island state with water between all the islands, but in Alaska, you know, it's almost the same kind of thing, except it's not water; it's forest, <laughs> and there are no roads between a lot yeah. of these cities. Only way to get around is by airplane and boat, you know, along the coastline. Well, one of the most remarkable things, I think, is that they have Juneau as their capital. And the only really way you can get to Juneau is by boat or by air. It seems like a, <laughs> seems like a, a difficult way to run a government. But, yeah, it does. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But I guess technology has helped them because they can talk on, you know, the phone and, and mobile and Internet and whatnot. So... That works, but I, I was amazed the same way. I was also amazed, you know, my wife and I were, you know, you only spend, you spend a little while in any given port, so we're walking around Juneau one morning. It's raining, it's cold, you know, it's, mm, it's a surprise for somebody from Hawaii. And, um, and this is, this is a shop right across from our coffee shop. We were sitting having coffee, and it says, no minors permitted. <laughs> so what's this about? Oh. Can you guess what it was? 
Oh, maybe it was people who used to be coal, go, <laughs> gold miners, perhaps. Or, huh? Plenty of that. Yeah. No, it was uh, marijuana. Oh. And not, not the medical kind. Oh, really? The recreational kind. Yeah. You know? So it's very interesting. It was closed at the time of the day. Oh, a bad break. <laughs> I guess so. Yeah. It would have been interesting. I would have felt so guilty, you know, walking across the street and having a toke. I wouldn't have done that. But it just is very interesting how that, that state is in a way more, you know, more advanced, more progressive than we are here. Well, it. it's interesting. The people that are on the ships, though, are different than the people who are going on land. Uh, they tend to be a little bit more upscale. Uh, there's a lot of uh, middle America that gets to Anchorage. They rent an RV for often. Yeah. And then they and their families go up to uh, Denali, principally. Yeah. I mean, I've been to Alaska on a couple other occasions, mostly for fishing purposes. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. Uh, and we did a lot of flying in and flying out of remote areas. It's a great place to go fishing. Yeah. And eat fish. Well, you know, uh, when you go to a place that's so remote and you're trying to get very prized type trout, you don't tend to eat them, you throw them back. And uh, so where do you think uh, that the lodge's food all came from? Flown in. <laughs> well, sorry. it came yeah. in from Seattle, the uh, Costco. <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah, pretty interesting. It was pretty good food. It pretty good. Those lodges are well known for the quality of their yeah. lifestyle. Yeah. yeah. We had we had uh, we had uh, crab dungeness crab that was really out of this world, taken out out of the um, inside passage there. No. Oh. And uh, and my favorite, of course, was salmon. Salmon out of uh, give me a town along that way. Uh, uh, yeah. Past Juneau, yeah. or rather southeast of Juneau. Yeah. Uh, the salmon capital of the world. Yes, exactly. That's the one. Yeah, that's Scal the Sa Scal Scalaway? No. Skagway? Skagway. But that's not the salmon capital. It begins with a K, I think. Oh, Ketchikan. Ketchikan, thank you. Yeah, right. That was really interesting. They had a lot of restaurants serving a lot of salmon. Yeah, well, they get a lot of salmon. I think they were, there was more salmon can there than any other place in the world at yeah. one time. Yeah, yeah, maybe not anymore. But um, the salmon we had was really good. It was, it was just beautiful salmon. Well, it's beautiful salmon until you watch them go up to the streams and spawn. Yeah, why? And then generally they, they waste away as they get up further and further into the stream and suddenly, and then they, uh, they spawn and then they die. And so you're up in the streams that are several miles inland and there's a lot of dead fish. And not as they go up these streams and these rivers, they, they become quite emaciated and not very attractive, although the bears like them. Yeah. That's why there are a lot of bears that time of year out having a, a yeah. big feast. Yeah. Did, you, did you stop at um, Icy Point Strait? Uh, you know, the I recognize Indian, the name. The Indian Island Indian Village. Oh, I don't think so. I, don't I was fascinated oh, with yeah. that place. Uh, it was an island, and it mm. was owned by the Indians. It was not a reservation, no. but they were Indians. Yeah. Uh, they were, oh, I'm blocking the name of the tribe, Tinklet, Tinklet Indians. Yeah. And they're, you know, throughout Alaska, they were in every, every town we stopped Well, in. we stopped in the uh, Anchorage Museum, and they have a special... They have a number of the tribes, but Tinglet is certainly, that's one of the three or four better known yeah. tribes and really good, very good museum, actually. Yeah. Really good museum. There are some very interesting, there's a lot, there's a great history, a great tradition in Alaska. Yeah. And, and it um, goes back a long way and some very exciting and maybe unpleasant things have happened in Alaska. <laughs> you know, I, you, you mentioned Skagway. Skagway is um, a town that was pretty raucous for a long time. And um, yeah. the, the photographs, early photographs of how life was in the mud streets of Skagway, a lot of rough and ready, a lot of a lot of fighting, yeah. <laughs> a lot of drinking. I think that's where the uh, gold rush was in the exactly. Yukon. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, Yukon, it's so they had actually a train that a train track that yeah. went from from there. Catch it was Catch Can Skagway. Skagway. Yeah. 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 Uh, before they had it, it was a very difficult walk for the miners. A little bit like uh, Australia in some ways. They wouldn't allow a miner to go into Canada unless he brought a lot of gear with him. Well, it was very hard to bring gear to go over these passes. And it might take uh, 10 or 12 times before they could have enough gear to get over to 
where the gold was being mined. Yeah. But the people that really made the money turned out was were the people that were servicing the miners, right. not the Selling miners them themselves. Yeah. yeah. So taking their last coins. Yeah. Right. You know, but I mean, it's interesting that uh, you know that's the feeling I had too that the the miners in the gold rush there they didn't really make money. They suffered a lot though. They worked so hard. Yeah. Uh, they they braved all kinds of weather and terrain and what. Um, and, and, and trouble because, you know, to get from Alaska to the mines, you had to go through Canada. Right? Yeah. And there was, that's an international boundary. It was a place... Um, well, it was very steep. Steep. Uh, yeah. The area to go through was exceedingly difficult. And that's why they, they built that, uh, that train. I forget what the name of it was. Something yeah, white in Yukon. Something, white something. White mountain yeah. train. Something right. like that. Well, yeah. yeah, it could have been. Yeah. It's good. Yeah. And they, and they had... Uh, did you go on the excursions? I mean, every stop there were excursions. And, we uh, did some of them. Uh, we actually did a helicopter trip where you land on one of the glaciers and get out and walk along the glacier. And that was quite uh, interesting. Uh, I've been to Alaska a few times and I can see the dramatic change yeah. in the glaciers, yeah. particularly like Mendenhall Glacier. Yeah, that's beautiful, that yeah, one. Yeah, but that one is, it's almost a mile, apart. you know, mile from where it was before, mm. miles. Back Do you see them falling into the water? Oh yeah, they call that calfing, I think. Yeah, they make a lot of noise as they go into the water. Yeah, it was pretty interesting. It was interesting how close the ship got to it. The ship would sort of back into that, and you really wouldn't be too far away, and you'd be, you know, close enough to hear the sound and see see the thing shear off that way. Yeah. And I couldn't. I mean, maybe this is wrong. Maybe you know more, but I I couldn't help but think this is part of the same process of of climate change and uh, you know. And well, it's partly a movement of a glacier anyway because it's on, yeah. a, on a slope. Yeah. It becomes a glacier when it's on a slope and yeah. then it does sort of move. Yeah. I mean, those glaciers, you know, one time, one of the great glaciers, they went all the way into New England, so they go <laughs> a long way. Good old days. Yeah. You know, but I was struck though with uh, first the remote wilderness aspect of uh, Alaska. I mean, it's the biggest wilderness in the country all by yeah. itself, huge. And the beauty of it, it's quite beautiful. It's, well, Denali it's, is particularly that oh, way. Sure. Yeah. Talk, talk about it. What's there? Well, it's a national park, and uh, there's about a 100-mile road of which, oh, maybe uh, 20 miles, the first 20 miles from going in from the north to the south is paved, and then the rest is not paved, and they only allow, uh, they don't allow uh, motor vehicles other than a couple of buses, so they have a bus that the national park has, and then there's a couple of private vendors who I think were there before the National Park, and they, and they give a, a tour. And uh, because there's so much, tra so little traffic that goes through there, the animals don't get very spooked when they see a little bit of... Oh, that's worth it right know. there, that alone. Yeah. I would say we saw, you know, wolves, and we saw bears, and we saw bears eating elk, and so all kinds of pretty interesting stuff, yeah. 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 Was it was the uh, Forest Service, United States Forest Service, in in, in, in residence there? Did you see them? Uh, Park Service. Park Service. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Very important up there. And then uh, at the end of the road, you can then board the bus and come back. But it's a hard road for for people like me. And uh, so we ended up taking a fixed wing airplane ride back, and then they go back up to the Denali, the the peak. There are only about twenty five percent of the people that get into Denali, they'd ever see the peak because it's so covered by uh, clouds and stormy yeah. weather. Yeah. But that was a beautiful trip, I'd say. That's a, it's pretty a trip by helicopter. Well, that was a fixed wing, but it was a beautiful trip. But where can you land? On the water? Well, you, you could, but there's actually back at the, at the town where Denali at the north and end that's, uh, that has an airstrip, and they don't have big airplanes that go in there, but there are a lot of there was a lot of small airplanes. I think, I forget what the number is, but it's very high. Like one out of eight Alaskans has a license for an airplane if they don't already own one. And it's, uh, so that's one of the easy ways to get around and the bush pilots. And Distributed uh, transportation industry is what it is. Everybody has a few airplanes. And yeah. As a result, they all network together and, and the place lives. Yeah. <coughs> it reminds me <coughs> also of the notion that in Alaska, because of the weather and the seasons and the remoteness, people are into a, a barter kind of economy in many places. You mean uh, like a cocktail lounge? <laughs> no, I'm serious. Tell me. 
Well, you said you said a bar. A barter, barter economy. Oh, barter. Yeah. Um, you know, I did see that in a couple of places. I didn't notice it as being so prevalent, but I did see it a few places where, in most places, you don't run into it at all. Yeah. Um, yeah, bars are an important thing because. Uh, it's, it's pretty dark <laughs> and it's pretty cold in the winter time yeah, and uh, yeah. yeah there's a lot of camaraderie a lot of I think there's a lot of fraternization among yeah. people in Alaska they yeah. have a lot of yeah. loyalty to one another yeah I agree and uh, and that's year-round and maybe especially when the tourists are not there yeah you know. let's take a short break Jeff sure uh, this is Jeff Grad he's a world traveler we're talking about uh, gee we're talking about traveling in Alaska and seeing the beauty of that place, especially now when it's jeopardized by climate change. We'll be right back. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. But I have a story, and I don't know where to start. I still have nightmares. I feel overwhelmed. I can't live like this anymore. I'm really not so good. But are you ready to listen? My friend, mother, what big eyes you have. She said, all the better to see you with, my dear. That's the wolf. What are you doing? Okay, cool. Research says reading from birth accelerates the baby's brain development. And you're doing that now? Oh, yeah, ah. yeah. this is the starting line. Hush. Ah. Ah. When this is over, you're dead. Read aloud 15 minutes. Every child, every parent, every day. Welcome to Sister Power. I'm your host, Sharon Thomas Yarbrough, where we motivate, educate, empower, and inspire all women. We are live here every other Thursday at 4 p.m., and we welcome you to join us here at Sister Power. Aloha and thank you. Get that far. Oh, yeah. Okay, we're back. We're live. We're talking about uh, <coughs> Jeff Grad and his world travels. And the, tr the trip he came back from most recently is uh, the Alaskan trip on Crystal, no? um, which is great, a great uh, passenger line. Anyway, that, that flies the same, the same ports that, that I went on a few weeks ago. And, and Carolyn Lee went before that on another trip, uh, also on Norwegian. But um, what I want to mention is, is the retail. You know, you get off these ships. And, you know, these ships hold a couple thousand people. Crystal's smaller, I think, but you get off these ships and they all get off. Everybody gets off and there you are. And the first reaction is, gee, it's, it's, um, it's dark. There's cloud cover. You can't see the peaks of the mountains. <laughs> um, you see, you know, there's snow up there somewhere. Um, but it's not like Hawaii, eh? <laughs> the sun is not shining. You travel on the ocean and it's, it's dark and um, it's raining. It's misty. It's foggy. And at first I said, gee, you know, we're at the wrong time, wrong place. This can't be, you know, this is not what we expected. But then I realized, I don't know if you had the same experience. Maybe you had better weather than I did. But it's the deal. That's the way it is. And you have to see it that way because it has its own beauty. And uh, don't expect the sunshine all the time. Yeah. What, what, what was your weather like? Uh, it wasn't terribly sunny, but it wasn't terribly rainy. Mm -hmm. And uh, was the cloud cover, which in a lot of ways is pretty good. Uh, you know, I got enough sun living in Hawaii, so, <laughs> right. it, you know, it wasn't, I didn't wear my shorts much. Uh, but I thought the weather, the weather in, the, in Anchorage actually is pretty similar to being in Vancouver and probably in Seattle. They all seem to get a lot of uh, weather that comes in off the Pacific. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, and they get a lot of it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did you get the piece about Anchorage uh, with the low buildings? The buildings in Anchorage are like two stories high, no more. And why is that? Because they've had some really devastating earthquakes up there. It's a big earthquake zone. Yes, know? it is, yeah. And, and, uh, I think some of the worst volcanoes have actually, and earthquakes have occurred up in, yeah. uh, up in Alaska. I didn't know that. I mean, I, I don't know why, but I, I should have figured that out. You know, when you think about it, the whole Pacific region is, is bounded by earthquake zones. Oh, yeah. From one end to the other, yeah. including the West Coast, including Japan. It's we the know. same plate, I think. Uh, yeah. You know, sub, 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 Something, sub, yeah. sub, 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 sub structure. Yeah. So um, the thing about the retail I was mentioning during the break is that we found, my wife was interested in the retail, 
Not that we bought anything, but she was interested, and so we go and talk to shop, you know, talk to shopkeepers, many of whom are from Hawaii. I'm not oh. kidding. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's a little trip they do. You know, they go there, they come back. Depends on the season. And uh, I mean, it's, you know, it's pretty appealing. You, you know, in, in the summertime, you can go to Alaska, enjoy it, come back. Anyway, found that a lot of the shops are are what do you call it, pop-up shops. Um, and, yeah, I mean, and they the, might be in pretty nice spaces. There. Yes. I mean, improved spaces, but you're right, they're popped up in a sense that they're only there during the ships traveling in and out season, which is probably a better part of 90 days. Yeah. Uh, so they have to make it. Well, it's not just the shopkeepers also. It's the people who are providing all the land options, the helicopters and sure. the fixed Curses, wings. Yeah, and the, yeah, yeah. You know, a lot of kayaking, uh, things like that. There yeah. are people who go fishing, and it was, yeah, it's a short season, but they, they, you know, they have to make it during that 90 days, and so things are pretty expensive. Yeah. Even relative to Hawaii, I would say that yeah. they're pretty expensive. Yeah. Yeah, it's true, and and so uh, you had to be careful about what you bought, and one of the, and one of the things that I noticed, I, at first I couldn't believe it, I couldn't understand it, I still don't understand it. Why shop after shop after shop from diamonds and jewelers, left and right? I said, why? Is, it, it, maybe this is something that, that spilled off the truck during the gold rush, you know? <laughs> maybe. <laughs> I, but diamonds, they don't, they don't have diamonds in, in Alaska. They have diamonds in this whole continent. Yeah. Why so many diamond stores? Well, I think they've got a lot of people who get off these ships that have time in their hands and they've got and money in their pocket, in their burning pocket. a hole in there. That's right. I mean, <laughs> you know, you always wonder when you go to a uh, into a fancy resort, there's always a lot of art galleries. Yeah. Because who has time other than when you're on vacation to really spend time in a in an art gallery? Yeah. And uh, so yeah, that's a it's pretty. Uh, you do see a lot of jewelry, and then yeah. a lot of other stuff that gets pretty repetitive. They're it does. very typical deals, typical yeah. things. <coughs> you know, and on the ships, <clears throat> there were art auctions on our oh. Norwegian Sun ship. And I had the feeling, I, I'm curious about your experience, I had the feeling that, you know, they knew that, y you know, you would feel constrained because it, it was a limited space amount, you know, amount of space on the ship. So. They had to entertain you. They had to give you stuff to do. They had to make a, a plan of the day that, that kept you occupied. Otherwise, you'd just sleep in your cabin all day, do nothing, get bored, and all that. And television wasn't so great because they, right. you know, satellite and all that. So <clears throat> they they kept on doing things: entertainment, oh, yeah. music, art auctions, uh, so many things to keep you going. And they would give you this plan of the day thing to keep you occupied, as if you needed to be occupied. I mean, I, you know, you could read. I did. But that w it was not designed for that at all. <laughs> what would you do all day, Jeff? With the kids, I, I'm sure oh, it was fun. Well, you know, uh, the beauty to the ships in Alaska is that they have a program set up for the kids. So although we did spend a fair amount of time with the kids, I think we probably spent as much time as they wanted to spend with us. <laughs> and uh, they had these, and the kids were nine and seven, and it just just worked perfect. You know, if these kids had been 15 and 20, they would have nothing to do with these, you know, in-house uh, camps. But it, yeah, yeah. but I think it's, I had sort of expected it on a, on a Disney cruise, but I was a little surprised that on other lines they would have children's programs and they I would say that was certainly what the kids did most of the time um, what did I do most of the time I did a fair amount of reading and uh, I they have a gymnasium I use the gym maybe three or four or five days out mm -hmm. of the seven mm -hmm. and of course there's hardly a, an hour or two that went by where I didn't have an ice cream cone <laughs> uh, you know something like that it is a vacation after yeah, all yeah I mean it was you know, <laughs> I'm sure I ate too much. <laughs> How was the food? You know, the food is good. It's uh, it's a pretty high end. Uh, you know, after seven days of that, I think that that was enough, enough. for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But you know, I, I think a lot of people on these cruises go there with the idea that they're going to really chow down, as they say. Yeah. Yeah. You could eat all day, all night. You could. Yeah. Yeah. Do they have formal dining on your ship. Uh, they, they did. They had some formal and some not so formal. Have to formal. wear a coat and tie? 
No, that's pretty, uh, it's the, the cruising industry has finally come around to the rest of the world. What do they call it, freestyle? Yeah, well, uh, cruise wear or something, but they, yeah. in fact, not only did no, no ties or even jackets were required, so that was quite that's a better. surprise from the days when you expected that you'd have at least one or two formal evenings. Yeah. Yeah. On, on the Norwegian Sun, you know, they had the stock restaurants where you could chow down all day and all night, mostly. And uh, they were located in various places around the ship. They also had these specialty restaurants oh, yes. where you'd pay extra, you know, for that particular meal. It was actually cheap because, you know, it was, it's just extra in addition to the meal you might otherwise have. And uh, they were pretty good. Some of them were really first class. Yeah, they had one on our ship. It was actually a Nobu restaurant. Really? Yeah. My favorite of all. Yeah. yeah. Wow. But again, it, they had a, a little extra that you had to pay above what they figured the normal food rate was, and, yeah. but, and, but nonetheless, as you say, it was, it was pretty uh, reasonable. Yeah. What about uh, the service? You know, there's always a, a question, you know, the, you, you expect they're going to kiss your feet uh, because this is, after all, all about service. Was it like that? I, I mean, the, the, feet, the yeah. feet kissing part. Yeah. Uh, I didn't have too many. Maybe one foot was kissed along the way, but for the most part, I don't remember <laughs> that as an issue. But people were very accommodating, and the service yeah, was... Yeah quite good and quite nice. I, I was uh, really interested in the uh, international polyglot of the crew, <clears throat> after that matter of the passengers. They were from everywhere. They were from everywhere. You could have every language the, spoken. Oh, the crew or the? <clears throat> the crew and the passengers. And the passengers, both. yeah. yeah. Uh, the crew the, tended to be, uh, <clears throat> on our boat, was a lot of Filipino help. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how it is on your ship. I know some of the ships have Indonesians and and they have some Scandinavians, some Eastern Europeans. Yeah, I, I mean, I like that. I, I, I really like polyglot of it. <clears throat> and you get to talk to them and they talk to you and it, it sets up a kind of international community around you and you feel like you're traveling, you're liberated, yeah. emancipated. Yeah. So <clears throat> this is not the only trip you're taking this, this, uh, this part of the year. Where else are you going? I'm actually gonna go next, uh, uh, this month to uh, place called Puglia. It's the southeast corner of uh, Italy. And it's, uh, yeah, it's, I'm looking forward to it. It's uh, mostly along the Adriatic Sea. And uh, we fly into a place called Bari, B-A-R-I, which I had been to as a youth because uh, it was a place to catch ferry boats to the old Yugoslavia. Oh, oh wow, yeah. So it's not that area actually, as the crow flies, isn't very far from the old Yugoslavia or even Albania. Yeah, or, or um, Croatia. Or, or the Croatia. Croa the yeah. Croatian crow, as they say. Yeah, yeah. actually, I went to uh, yeah Dalmatia in that area yeah. when I last time. Very yeah. interesting. Well, I <clears throat> I hope that uh, <clears throat> hope that's a good trip for you. But I know if it was me, I'd be, I'd be looking at Europe to see the changes. I'd be looking at Europe to see the, the, you know, the migrant issue and how people are reacting to that. I'd be looking at Europe to see Europe of, the, of, 2000, of 2017 because it's different than it was, say, 10 years ago. Oh, yeah, it should be an interesting trip. And this whole area is what they call the Mezzogiorno. So it's, you know, it's, it was really the, the, the poorest section and... Uh, the section uh, that needed the most help from the Italian government. So I haven't been down there for a number of years, but I'm sure it's improved over when I was last there, which might have been now 25 years ago. But that's, it's a, it was a real down and out area, but it, physically it's got, it's a beautiful area to travel through. It actually of the, uh, uh, I think it raises almost 60% of the grapes that are used for wine in Italy. It's not a bad thing. Yeah, so that's a good thing. Enjoy that. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> I hope they have internet, and I hope when you're there, you watch thinktechhawaii.com. I will. I wouldn't miss it. I don't miss any of your shows. <laughs> All right. He's not kidding. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. Okay, my boy. Good to have you. Nice to be Wonderful. here. Wonderful. Okay. Lunch together. All right. <laughs>